Good evening, everyone. Again, thank you for stopping through uh, on this evening. Um, I believe one of the big reasons why people don't pray, and there's probably a lot of reasons, but I think one of the biggest reasons why people don't pray is because they don't see results. Uh, it can be frustrating to um, pray a sincere prayer, you know, with all of your feelings and heartfelt and, and not to have it answered. Um, but it's not because God doesn't hear. It's not because God doesn't see. There may be some reason why your prayer is getting answered. If you're curious, come on in. Let's talk. Can anybody testify? Can anybody say that hey, I've seen too much? Uh, I've, I've experienced too much. I, I've walked through some difficult places and uh, you, you can't convince me otherwise. I have to testify. I have to tell of his goodness. Everybody has their own testimony of what God has done and what he's brought them through, how they kept their minds, how um, uh, he prayed and, and, and he answered and he came through it right in the nick of time. Um, do you have a testimony? And each every, and everyone listening does have a testimony. I have to testify. So good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, we're going to jump right into this, um, open up in prayer, and then we're going to uh, jump into tonight's topic. I'm still talking about the importance of prayer. All right. So, Father, uh, we thank you for another opportunity, Lord, that we get to hear your word. Uh, we don't come to hear a, a man's opinion. Uh, we don't come to hear um, whatever the a going knowledge of the day is father we want to hear directly from you father um so we thank you father that in this place today lord we give a holy spirit um space and opportunity uh to pull back the covers and to uh, reveal that which has been existing from the beginning of time but now is the time and now is the space for it to be revealed so father we move all flesh out of the way and we say, have your way in this place. In Jesus name, amen, amen. All right, um, as you can tell, I am excited about uh, tonight. We are continuing uh, our series talking about uh, the importance of prayer. And so uh, up until uh, this point, uh, we've kind of been uh, covering um, different aspects uh, of prayer life. I just kind of highlighting, like I said, Dr. Tyler says, the importance of a prayer life. We kind of started out, you know, as uh, most people should start out every year. It's just locking into what God has for you, laying on your face, cutting off the TV, you know, putting your phone down and saying, okay, God, I'm getting quiet at the beginning of this year. I am consecrating myself. I'm coming aside because I want to hear from you, Father. Uh, I have my own set of goals that I might have, not resolutions, because please, that stops like two weeks right after you make them right. It's like some goals that I want to accomplish this year, Father. But I want to align myself with what, what you want me to do, Father. So I want to get quiet and come away. I just don't want to talk about it but I want to be about it. I don't want to just be a hero. I want to be a doer of it as well. Uh, and so we started out there uh, the beginning of the series at the beginning of the year saying, okay, Lord, we want to lock into what 2024 has for us. Um, and then we talked about um, how prayer covers. Um, you can get into a space to where uh, the enemy can't see you. Uh, we talked about Brother Job and, and Job did something phenomenal. He rose up early. That means he still had to sleep in his eyes. But he was so dedicated with his relationship of God that he was like, I'm covering my family. They might have done something last night. I don't know. Um, they might have been partying or doing whatever. They might have said something. It wasn't even a shit. They might have done something, God. So I'm covering them. And I'm covering them every morning. Uh, first thing in the morning. Early in the morning, I will rise and I will seek you. Uh, I'm coming away because... I want to cover my family. Not only my family, I'm covering my possessions. Not that my possessions are more important than you, but I realize that you have given to them, given them to me for a purpose, right? It's not just me to say I have this and I have that, but it's it's for uh, it's for an assignment. 
Uh, so let's say I won like the, the lottery. I would halfway be happy and then halfway not because I'm like, okay, Lord, if you allow me to win this, I know that there is something that this money is earmarked for. So let me get quiet so that I can hear from you that I'm not in my flesh and talking about, oh yeah, and I'm going to buy a house for every day and, and a car for, no, no. Uh, I'm seeing what God uh, would have uh, me to do. And so last week we talked about um, talking about uh, you know, sometimes when you get into uh, situations uh, and you have a prayer life, your response can be a little differently, a little different than most people. Um, we looked at David and he was going through, I mean, he was going through some chaos. I mean, chaos was all around him. And it's one thing when you feel like you're being attacked. Uh, it's one thing uh, when you feel um, that it may be unfair. But when you feel guilty about some of the chaos, because you feel like you caused some of it, let's just be real, um, you can get into a space where you you act in a uh, unholy manner, we'll just put it like that. But one thing that David said that we highlighted last week, he said, Abithar, bring me the ephod. <laughs> he, he didn't give people a piece of his mind. He didn't tell them. He didn't cuss them out. He said, with all this is going on around me, I need to hear from my father. So I don't need to give people a piece of my mind. I need direction. Abithar, which was a high priest, bring me the ephod so I can go before my father in prayer. So that's where we are. So now we're going to shift a little bit for the next uh, few weeks and kind of get into some topics that if you're talking about prayer, you should address, right? Um because everybody doesn't have that dynamic prayer life. Uh, there are some people that can pray and you're like, oh my gosh, you are just calling down the heavens. But you know, you kind of look at yourself and be like, well, I don't think I'm really doing it like that. And not that it's a competition, but you're just admiring the way they pray. It's like they just have this love affair with God or they just say the right words or they just make things sound so good. Um, and so when you're talking uh, about the importance of prayer, it's wise, right? To really get into um, why prayer may not be going through like you want it. You might have been praying some stuff for years and haven't seen it. You know, you might be a little discouraged. Um, and it's caused you not to pray as much as you had in the past. Uh, and then, you know, when you don't get answers, you know, you get discouraged. It's 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 a it's a, a natural cause and reaction. I'm not getting the results. I'm praying. I'm not getting the results. Okay, I'm not praying as much because, you know, I start doing life right. Um, but this week we're talking about all rise, all rise, and you might um, be familiar with that term. Um, but we're going to go into a little bit further. Uh, so I made a Facebook post last week. Um, and part of that post said, in order to get biblical results, you have to follow biblical patterns. I'm going to say it again. In order to get biblical results, you have to follow biblical patterns. And I'm amazed sometimes, you know, I look at people and they'll make statements that they're doing stuff for God. They're doing stuff for God. And I'm like, okay, so what you're saying that you want to do is outlining this word. So I'm I'm thinking, you know, you you're doing X. And in the Bible it says, well, if if you say X, then you should do Y, but then they're doing A and they're doing A, F, Q, L, M, N, O, P. Nothing to what the Bible lays out to do, right? Um, people will say that they love God. And I was like, okay, that's a good thing to love God. But then they'll say, well, I'm showing God love by getting a tattoo that says I love God on it. Or they'll say something like, oh, I'm out here and I'm feeding the homeless, you know, because I love God. And nothing wrong with those things, right? But the Bible says that if you love me, keep my commandments. But you're not doing that. You want peace and every believer has a right to peace. So if you don't have peace in your life at this moment, at this juncture in your life, you can have peace. But the scripture says he'll keep you in perfect peace 
if your mind is stayed on him. So if you don't have peace, is your mind stayed on him? You want a biblical result. You have to follow biblical patterns. Uh, and so uh, if, if you've ever done anything in church, right? Um, <laughs> if you've ever done like a... Um, uh, like a um, uh, a youth day program, uh, you you'll you'll know this 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 psalm here. So we're we're, we're starting in Psalms 100, 100, and, and I can't tell you how many uh, youth day services that I was delighted to be in. Um, and we use this scripture, right, the 100 psalm. You, you hear it quoted in church a lot. Uh, and so uh, it says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. When you come into the presence of a king, you just don't walk in. You just, you just don't come into the presence of a king. There are protocols to get into his presence. If you look at the tabernacle, uh, the tabernacle of Moses, uh, you just didn't go into the holies of holies. Matter of fact, there was only one person that went in there, but you just didn't go in there. You had to go from the outer court to the inner court through the veil into the holies of holies. There were steps. There were a process. There was a pattern that you had to go through to get to the holies of holies where the ark was mercy seat. The, between the rings of the chair where the presence of God resided. So you just didn't get into the presence of God. There were steps that you had to go through to get there. Uh, and Robert Henderson wrote uh, that there are three dimensions of prayer. Three dimensions of prayer. Uh, approaching God as father, approaching God as friend, and approaching God as judge. Uh, and so when you're approaching God as father, uh, in Luke 11 and 2, you're approaching God for the things that you need. Father, I need a healing. Uh, Father, I need um, I need uh, to pay this bill. I, I need uh, I need medicine. Um, uh, There's some things that are lacking that you know that I'm bringing before you. Uh, I need peace. I, I need joy. Um, there's there's some things that are lacking that I, God, I, I really need these things from you. When you go into God as Father, you're, you're approaching Him for things that you need. When you're approaching God as friend, uh, in Luke 11, 5 and 6, you're coming to God for the needs of others. Uh, you're, you're praying and you're interceding on behalf of someone. Uh, you could be in the presence of, of a person, of a friend, or of a stranger, and you hear someone you know talking about a need and you just instantly go into prayer. You, you're not you know, bringing attention to yourself and, and the other person may not even know you're praying, but you're interceding for them. You're saying, Father, I'm coming on behalf of my brother and my sister. They need this. They need they need that. Uh, their kids are in this situation. Uh, you know, mom is concerned about uh, the son being strung out on drugs or uh, the daughter being caught up in prostitution or they got kidnapped or something like that. You're coming to God on behalf of someone else. Uh, then when you come into God as judge uh, in Luke uh, 18 and 3, um, you are coming to him, coming to God uh, when you're dealing with or you want justice from your adversary. When you want uh, justice from your adversary. So when you pray, you are entering a conflict. I know, have any of us ever felt that? Uh, that in, in prayer, there was like something that was just coming against us. Uh, you ever been in prayer and you're talking to God and then some non-gospel music, non-gospel song just begins to flood your mind, right? Uh, and then just takes you off track to what you were saying or, or the train of thought or God may have dropped something in your spirit and, and now, you've, now you've forgotten or now you've gotten off track to something else. Um, uh, that conflict... Uh, is something that's trying to hinder our words. Uh, so the conflict that we are in is, is one between you wanting to speak the will of God into the earth and one who wants to destroy what God wants to put in place. So when you engage in prayer, when you engage in prayer, 
you are not entering a battlefield. You're not entering a battlefield, but you are entering a courtroom. Entering a courtroom. So in, in Romans 12 and 19, it says, Beloved, do not avenge yourself. Do not, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. This is God talk. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. So what God is saying is you don't have to worry about the battle. I'll handle it. Don't avenge yourself. Don't try to get vengeance for yourself. God says, I got that. When you give your life to Christ, you become a kingdom citizen. And citizens don't fight. The military does. Let me say that one more time. Citizens don't fight. The military does. So in Psalms 91 and 11, it gives us insight into who God uh, has designed to war on our behalf. And what does it say? For he commands the angels in regard to you to protect and defend you and guard you in all your ways. You don't have to fight. God has angels that are specifically designed for you to fight. You're not entering a battlefield. You're entering a courtroom. And so in Luke um, 18, uh, it talks about uh, the widow that um, was, was going to get justice from this judge. And look what it says in the first verse. It says, now, therefore, a widow, uh, there was a widow in a city and she came and said, get justice for me from my adversary. Um, and the, the first, and when you, when you look at the first verse in, in that chapter, it says that men ought to always pray and not lose heart and not lose heart. And there is no way for you to lose heart unless you stop praying. There's no way for you to lose heart unless you stop praying. Why is that? Because your words give it life. If you keep speaking to it, it continues to live. If you stop talking to it, it dies. So to get justice from her adversary, she went to the judge. So in the courtroom of heaven, you have certain players in the room. Of course, you have Jesus, who is our advocate. Uh, First John 2 and 1, uh, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We have... Uh, those who fill the courtroom and scripture calls them the cloud of witnesses and who are they they are the ones that have gone on before us that are now cheering us on saying yes and answer the case encouraging you don't give up continue to answer the case you're in a courtroom continue and they're they're they're, they're cheering us on these clouds of witnesses are cheering us on uh, and then you have God, who is what? The righteous judge. And I love this. Psalm 7 and 11. It says, God is a just God, or a just judge, or a righteous judge. And God is angry. Listen to this. He is angry with the wicked every day. <laughs> he, is, he is sitting in that courtroom steaming at the enemy because he knows that the accusations that he's bringing are false. He knows that they are false. But he has to hear the case. And as, as in any judge, they may know that whoever's being accused didn't do it. But what evidence has to be presented? So it has to be presented so that he can what? Rule on their behalf. And then we finally have our adversary. 1 Peter 5 and 12. Be sober. Be sober. Self-controlled. Be vigilant, watchful, because your adversary, who the devil, <laughs> walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's gathering evidence against you, roaming around, seeking whom he may devour. Now, that word adversary in the Greek is anti dikos. In the Greek, it's called anti dikos. So it's, it's, it's two words that are put together. Anti, which means deny, and dikos, which means right. 
So a person who denies your rights, it's a legal opponent. This is all legal terminology. And of course you have the devil who is the slanderer. So in order for us to get the breakthrough in what we're praying for, the charges levied against us has to be answered. Jesus died uh, for us to have everything, but we don't have the things he wants us to have because there is a case against us. And so the keys to our breakthrough, what are those keys? And of course we can go to Revelations 12 and it outlines what those keys are. And they overcame by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. So that word overcame is called nikau, and it means to win a victory over. So in order for you to win in the courts of heaven, you have three keys. You have the blood of the lamb, you have the word of your testimony, and you have not loving your life to death. And so the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. So the blood speaks. The blood, it has a voice. In Genesis 4, uh, in verse 9, uh, this is the scene where Cain and uh, with Cain and Abel. And so Cain killed Abel. And so this is what the conversation that he had with God. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother? And then he gives the infamous response. Am I my brother's keeper? I don't know. And God was like, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. His blood is speaking to me. So we overcome by agreeing with what the blood is saying. And so three things we want to highlight. One, the blood speaks of forgiveness. It, it gives God the legal right to forgive sin. I, I can pray, Lord, I ask uh, that the blood speak for me uh, concerning this sin, this fault, uh, these thoughts, etc., uh, and to them to be covered under the blood. So in the Old Testament, we talked about the tabernacle a few minutes ago. Uh, the high priest once a year uh, would go through all this cleansings and all the other things that were required and would go past the veil and would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. And that gesture would remove Israel's sin for one year. The blood speaks forgiveness. The blood also has the power to answer every accusation that the devil would bring against you in court. In order for the blood to do this, we have to repent. And 1 John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all sin, from all unrighteousness, if we only confess. And the third thing is the blood speaks of Jesus' passion for you to win for him the rewards of his suffering. The blood doesn't just forgive. It, does, it doesn't just heal. Uh, it doesn't just protect you. Um, it, 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 uh, it cries out for his purpose to be done in the earth. And the thing that I love about Romans 5, um, even before even while we were sinners, even while we were doing things that wasn't pleasing to him, he paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. He demonstrated, he demonstrated his love for us and he paid the ultimate price. And he paid it just for that we would have an option because there are some that's not going to accept it. And that may be hard for some of you because there may be some loved ones that you're like, it's, it's right there. You have the answer right in front of you. And it's hard to see a loved one go down a wrong path. And you know it and, and you have to let them go because they have to make that decision. They can't, they can't be forced. They have to make that decision themselves. 
but he demonstrated that. He demonstrated his love for us. Um, and he and when he died and when we accepted him because he died for us now we die for him he gave his life before we accepted so when we made him lord and savior what we were saying is okay god you died for me now i die for you so the blood first key second key the word of your testimony you have a right to speak on your own behalf in a court of law you have the right to offer up your own testimony so in the court of heaven what are you saying is what you are saying lining up with his word uh in Numbers 13, uh, this is the scene where uh, God has has now brought the children of Israel um, out of Egypt through the Red Sea, went to Mount Sinai, and has 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 told them previously, "I have this land that I prepared, a land flowing with milk and honey," and He's ready to take them into the Promised Land. Uh, and so, the beginning of that chapter, uh, the Lord says. Um, send spies into the land choose a man one man from every tribe 12 tribes send them into the land to spy out the land uh, and and Moses gave the order and so 10 of the spies came back with a bad testimony <laughs> they, they told the people they prophesied uh, that we are not able to go up against the people in the land because they're giants. And, and here's the part. And, and we are like grasshoppers in our own sight. So, so now you are interpreting what, some, what you think somebody else is thinking about you. They haven't even had the conversation. They're saying we are grasshoppers in our own eyes, which means we see ourselves as small. There is no way that we can do this. So instead of agreeing with what God said, spirit, they believe what their eyes saw, natural. Because God had already told them, this is your land. I want you to go spy it out. Bring back some evidence. Uh, the, the the fruit that bring back some some evidence from the land to show how plentiful it is and how fertile the land is so you can give a testimony to the people and 10 gave a bad testimony so in the court of heaven they were denied entrance and lost their case a judgment was rendered for them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years so you had 10 people that now determine the fate of a nation for four decades. Your money testifies on your behalf. <laughs> People get squeamish when you start talking about money. But in, in Matthew 5, it talks about it. He says, if you bring your gift to the altar and, and you remember that there is an issue that you have with your brother, then you need to leave your offering there. Get up go reconcile with your brother and then come back and give your gift. Agree with him quickly. Lest when you come, you're convicted, the judge hands you over and you're thrown into prison. And you don't get to leave prison until every penny is paid off. So the fact that God brought this to your remembrance is an indication that he's attempting to prevent you from making a mistake. Number one, the idea is that you not use it as an excuse when God reminds you, hey, you have this all before you give this, you have this all. You have this issue with your brother, with your sister uh, that you need to remedy. Uh, don't use it as excuse uh, to not give. D don't use it as an excuse to be like, you know what? Uh, 
let me just take this back and you know we'll revisit this next week no no that's that's not the point of of him reminding you um what he's saying is you need to get up and get it right with your brother so that you can now freely give your offering that there is no uh, wrong motive with you with you with you giving that you're not convicting yourself of of now um submitting this offering and God brought it to your remembrance. It was like, hey, you got this issue that you need to address. So God wants to bless you. He wants to bless you and rule on your behalf. But if the offering is given with the wrong motive, the adversary is given evidence to block the blessing. Or in this case, able to throw you in prison and to put you in a space where you are not free when scripture clearly says that whom the son sets free is free indeed but you are bound because your offering spoke against you because you had wrong motives in giving so we have the key of the blood we have the key of your testimony and now we have the key of not loving our life to death when we give our life to Christ, we lay down our lives for God. We surrender to his will and to his purpose. Um, it's no longer about what we want, uh, but it's about his purpose for our lives. Uh, Romans uh, 3 and 21, um, it, it says that... Um, now the righteous, and I, and, I, and I pulled this from the Amplified because I like the way that it says, it says, but now the righteousness of God has been clearly revealed, no doubt, independently and completely apart from the law. Though it is actually confirmed by the law and the prophets, your scriptures, it's, it's confirmed by them. The righteousness of God comes through what? Faith in Jesus Christ. For all those, it doesn't matter who you are, Jew or non-Jew, that covers everybody. It's all those who believe and who acknowledge uh, there is no distinction. There, there is no separation. There is no one rule for this group and, and one rule for this group. It's all the same. You have to believe by faith. Uh, so I am made righteous because of my faith. Um, righteousness or right standing uh, with God is never a result of keeping the rules. I want to say that one more time. Because I don't know how many times people talk about, oh, I'm just trying to let, I'm just trying to do it like, like they like they have this this tablet in front of them and, and they're checking off rules. No, no, no. When it when it declares you righteous, it's got nothing to do with you either keeping the rules or breaking the rules. If you break the rules, guess what? You're still righteous. If you keep the rules, guess what? You're still righteous because the righteousness that you have is not yours. Jesus gave you that righteousness. So there's nothing that you can do to earn it or to lose it. We are righteous because uh, Jesus gave us his righteousness. Righteousness is the result of living under the mandate and government of the Holy Spirit. So when you engage in prayer, you are entering the courtroom. And, you, and the only thing that you need, the only thing that you need, um, is for the judge to rule in your favor. That's all you need, for the judge to rule in your favor. So no, when we were talking about the story um, of the persistent widow in Luke 18, if you read uh, those first eight verses, you'll find something very interesting. The widow wanted justice, but note that there was no emotion in involved. There was no, you know, oh my God, you know, all this other, there was no emotion. The judge was not moved by her emotions, but she ruled in her favor because of her persistence and because of her knowing the protocol. I come into the court of heaven and I know how to conduct myself. Revelation gave us the key. The blood testifies on my behalf. Am I agreeing with what the blood says? Is my testimony lining up with his word? And am I putting my life above what God says? Or am I laying it down for him? 
And when you are in that courtroom, that's that's why when when some people when they pray, they may not be getting their prayer answered because they don't know the protocol. They're wanting a biblical result, but they're not following the pattern. And sadly enough, some people don't know the pattern. They don't know that 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 conflict is is actually a courtroom. And if you look the way they describe Jesus, Jesus is our advocate. That's a legal term. God is the righteous judge. That's a legal term. Our adversary, that's a legal term. Cloud of witnesses, legal terms all around us. And so when we enter that courtroom of heaven, you have God sitting there with his gavel, waiting, waiting to rule on your behalf. And all he's waiting for you to do is to answer the charges so that he can give you a not guilty verdict so that he can give you that breakthrough that you've been praying for. Not that you cried for, not that you snotted for, but the ruling that you desire because you followed the protocols and you answered the charges so that he can say, not guilty. So Father, I thank you um, that you laid things out for us, Father. You lay things out for us, Father, so that we know that when we come into that courtroom, when we drop down on our knees and we're praying, we're coming to you either as, as father, as friend, or as judge. We know how to approach you, Father. We know that you love us enough that you are dying to rule on our behalf. You hate the enemy day and night, Lord. Psalm 7 laid it out for us. You are the righteous judge. And you're waiting to rule on behalf of your children. But we have to follow the protocols. We have to follow the patterns. But we are reassured that when we do, not if, when we do, whatever we ask, we will be given. Whatever we seek, we shall find. And whatever door we knock on, whatever space that we're desiring to get access to, it will be ours. So this is the confidence that we have, Father, that as we follow the rules, we get the results. Biblical rules, biblical results, we get the glory. 